Welcome to the Miller Experience, where we have up close and personal conversations with people that I admire that's doing big things and fixtures in the game. And my next guest is definitely one of them people. My next guest won a national championship for the 2001 University of Miami Hurricanes. In 2002, he was drafted by the Green Bay Packers as a running back slash fullback. In 2006, he then continued his NFL career with the Pittsburgh Steelers, playing through 2006 to 2008. His final stop in the NFL was the Indianapolis Colts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Mr. Najee Davenport. Now, I'm kind of geeked up, ain't gonna lie, man. I'm a Florida Gator fan, but y'all era at UM? Bruh, y'all some beasts, man. So, And also, I'm a Green Bay Packer fan. All right, so I'm definitely geeked. All right, so I appreciate, I definitely appreciate you coming on. Um, let's start off about yourself, man. Um, where are you from? What made you get into football? Do you do any of other sports? Let's talk about that. I'm from Miami. Okay. Uh, what made me got in, I mean, I play a lot of, we had these things called Peace in the Hood games. And uh, Peace in the Hood games is something, honestly, I don't know who started it, but it'd be like different, uh, different little hoods play each other you know we grow up and you got three mile radius you all kind of packed in the same spot but you had like so much like scott projects and you know robin hood and overtown and brown subs and we all kind of had like a a playoff series like every weekend we go into these different neighborhoods and we have like a like a game okay. game like sometimes 59 to 60 you know yeah, it's just yeah. you play until you get tired type game and uh that's what i played for a long time uh, I was always kind of like, you know, big boned. I guess that's the term. You know, I was I was heavy for my age, like a young age, and not like I was overweight. It was just like I was solid. And uh, he used to put me in a car with a, a plastic bag on, and he'd run in like a little homemade sauna to kind of get underweight. So I did that for like a week and a half, and I decided right then I didn't want to play football. <laughs> if I had to go that, I, if I had to do that, I didn't want to play ball. Yeah. Uh, so then, like my my freshman year of high school, I came out and one of my friends was like, "Hey man, come play football." I'm like, "No, nah, I don't feel like doing that that whole sauna thing, sitting in the car, trying to lose weight uh, thing." So then one of my coaches came out. Well, he came in and kind of told me what it was, and I went from there. What position you originally played? You start off playing. You always played running back. Uh, yeah, that's it. Running back, linebacker. Okay. Was uh. I mean, they kind of had me, I don't want to say everywhere, but like both sides of the ball. And I was always bigger and faster than a lot of people. So it was like running back, linebacker. But when I when I first started, well, I couldn't catch AIDS, man. <laughs> it, was, it was bad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, in 2001, let's talk about that 2001 season, man, that magical season y'all had. Um, you had the likes of Willis McGahee, um, Andre Johnson, Clinton Portis, Frank Gore. Uh, Mike Rump, the legendary Sean Telly, probably was a freshman back then, I believe. But um, you had them guys on it. Man, tell me about them se that season. Tell me about, you know, playing with them guys. That 2001 season, kind of like the, kind of like the end of it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. That uh, it started like in 90, 98, I want to say. It started with my freshman class and the class before me. And we called them uh, two G's and Deuce One. I did a documentary uh, a while ago called it "The You Reloaded." You can find it on YouTube. Okay. Uh, for all your listeners, it kind of it details the process from how we went from being a five and six season, a five and six team, to a national championship, and like what it took uh, mentality-wise, what it took dedication that brotherhood that you build in the locker room on and off the field. And uh, I think everybody else kind of fed off that. My, like you just named those guys and, you know, from that 2001 team, you think, man, that's, that's a hell of a, you know, lineup, you know, to have, you know, you know, those guys. But when I give you my freshman class <laughs> and you can see where I'm, where I'm coming, my freshman class, it was myself, Ed Reed, uh, Santana Moss, Reggie Wayne, Dan Morgan, you know, Joaquin Gonzalez, Kenny Kelly, which went to play baseball. Uh, we had about four or five more people that actually made it to the league. Mm -hmm. 
13, James Lewis, Marquise Fitzgerald, they're Devin Brown. They, they had everybody didn't have a career like Ed Reed. Someone played like two or three years, but like we had 13 scholarships my freshman year, and 12 of us made it to the league. Well, 12 of us, 11 of us, 11 of us was drafted, and one was like a free agent. Yeah. And then that kind of the mentality we had in the class before that was Damian Lewis, Ed and James, Al Blaze, Nate Webster. Bubba Franks. So our two classes kind of came in and we jailed and we had to understand what it took to be a hurricane. And we kind of looked at the, you know, Irvins and Michael Barrows and Jesse Armstead's. They used to come back south. They used to come back and kind of preach what a hurricane is. It's, it's a little different because when you come from a championship team and you come back and you talk to young kids, the young cats, you got a different understanding of what it takes to get to that level. And that's what, you know, we was new, we was young, we was freshmen. And having those guys come back in and say, hey, you know, we need to do X, Y, Z, you got to establish this, you got to establish that. We bought into it and we bought into the system, we bought into Coach Davis' program and everything that came with him and Jimmy Johnson. And this is what it takes to be a Super Bowl champion. This is what it takes to be a, a national champion. We bought. We bought into it. So everybody who came after us, they had no choice. So the next year you had uh Clinton Portis come in. You know, EJ was already there. EJ was EJ was in class in front of me. Ed and James was in class in front of me. He going to the Hall of Fame now. Uh my sophomore year, we had Clinton Portis come in and then and Jared Payton. And after that, Willis came in. And after that, Frank came in. Then we had, you know, Sean Taylor, Antrell Rowe, Kenny Phillips. Uh, I mean, the list go on. <laughs> just sitting here trying to name everybody is going to be crazy. But, you know, we built like a – we built like the, the blueprint. This is what it takes. And that's why you see us kind of go from that 5 and 6 to that 8 and 3 to that 11 and 1, that 12 and 0, and then again that 12 and 1 when we lost that second national championship. And then it kind of, it fell off, off after that. I believe it fell off in the people in my circle. The, that mentality, because the younger guys would come in and before they have a good two or three years to kind of like instill what it takes to be a hurricane into the next generation, they was leaving. They were leaving early. So they, they really had no, no locker room presence to kind of dictate, hey, this is how it's done. And that's you know that's one of our opinions that that's how I fell off. I'm telling you, man, like the Miami and um, Florida State games was legendary, man. And I'm a Gator saying this, all right. So you know, y'all, you already know. So you think you guys, the new era of Hurricanes, the 2020, 2021, you think y'all, do you looking at these guys, you think they'd be back to the way you guys were? I like to say my opinions, man, because every year, you know. I got you. Every so, year we got somebody coming in and it's, it's going to be the savior. It's going to be the savior and it, it wind up be the same, the yeah. same BS. I think uh, until you get a group of guys, a group of freshmen, that we can get our hands on and kind of dictate, hey, man, this side this needs to be ran. Well, we got to find that formula as well because when we was playing, we didn't have really like a lot of social media. We was really uh, – team built you know it wasn't really in the we weren't really like individuals you know what i mean it was hey you see one of them, you see 20 of us that type of we had that type of mentality gotcha. nowadays it's a little different you know social media the brand and everything is me 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 and we had that type of atmosphere you know it's it's a little hard to jail yeah. if you if you get my my pick but uh it's gonna it's gonna be a it's gonna take like maybe like five or six freshmen that's that's the top tier dogs and kind of say, put the team on their back and hey, regardless, this is what we're going to do. Okay. You need to be here at a certain time. You need to do this. You need to do that. And, uh, and be unselfish. That's going to change that program. I don't think the coaching going to change that program. I don't think the recruits that they bring in, unless they dogs, unless they got one, one goal and that's to win a national championship and do what it takes. That's, that's going to change that program until then. We're going to have those good seasons and then they fall off at the end and we're going to start off slow and then we're going to pick up at the end. 
and it's going to be a roller coaster. You graduated University of Miami with a bachelor's arts degree in theater with a minor in education. Was your goal all, always to go into the NFL or you was planning on going into theater or becoming a teacher? It was a teacher. Uh, like this football stuff was kind of new to me. I won't say it was new to me, but it was like me taking it serious was kind of new. But my, my mom was a teacher and uh, like I just automatically assumed I was going to be a teacher. Uh, I ain't really take football seriously as far as like, you know, going to the league into after EJ got drafted. Now I'll take that back. Uh, Dwayne Starks got drafted like my freshman year and they was having, we was all in the locker room watching D Star get draft, drafted. Then they started talking about it. Then the next year, you know, EJ did a whole big old thing they did with EJ and him, him getting drafted. That made me want to play in the league a little bit more. Other than that, it was just being, being able to compete, you know. So in 2002, you was drafted in the fourth round by the Green Bay Packers. How was that process? It was smooth. It was, uh, I was told, you know, when they reached, I had broke my foot uh, at Pro Day. And uh, prior to that, they was like, well, it's going to be a late first round pick, early second. And then I broke my foot. And then uh, yeah, then I, just, I dropped to the fourth. But I think Green Bay was a good place for me to, to end up, I think it was, uh, I think the tradition, you know, I was I was built on tradition. So I think uh, going there and seeing what they had in store and the legacy that those guys left behind, I think it was, I thought it was a good opportunity for me. And uh, when I came through, I was drafted as a fullback. And I think I played fullback for like a week and they moved me to tailback, which I was happy. So I think overall it was a great experience, you know, having, reaching a, you know, it wasn't a dream, but it's like the next level. Yeah. Now, 2005, I believe that was your last year in Green Bay? Yeah. Aaron Rodgers was drafted during that time. How, how, how was Aaron Rodgers as a player then, and what do you think about his situation dealing with Green Bay now? He was just like a rookie, like any other rookie from what I can remember. Uh -huh. uh, he was confident. You can see that. He had a little chip on his shoulder. And uh, with the situation now, I think it's, it's football. You know, it's, it's these guys taking control of uh, their likeness and their branding. They're just taking it from outside of the locker room to inside the locker room. Now, you think about it, you have a lot of marketing-wise, you got a lot of control over what you do outside and no control on the inside because it's a part of the organization. But, you know, when you realize that you got power and you can you can use it, you know, a lot of fans ain't going to be happy because all they see is the big picture. Yeah. But then you got to go home. You got to be happy with this, whatever decision that you make uh, going forward. So I think he's he doing what he needs to do. Yeah, as a Packer fan, man, I'm with you on that, man. Um, I understand it's, everything's business, it's money. I just pray that Jordan Love is the truth, my man. That's all I'm hoping right now. <laughs> How do you feel about... Hey, exactly, exactly. And when Brett, when the situation with Brett came, was coming, I was saying the same thing. I hope Aaron Rodgers is the truth. And you see how that panned out. So I was saying the exact same thing. How do you feel about college players receiving money outside of scholarships and not having the university pay them but being um, compensated for the use of their face, voice, likenesses, such as speaking engagements, commercials, radio ads, starting and producing a YouTube channel? Because I saw something on a podcast called I Am Athlete. It was a former college football player. I think he was a kicker. He was making money, mad money. Yeah. And he, he ended up, they gave him a choice. He was making mad money off his YouTube channel. And they ended up giving him a choice. He either got to keep his scholarship or keep his YouTube channel. He kept his YouTube right. channel. So how do you feel about that? I think it's awesome, man. Anytime you get to capitalize on what you love and, it, and it's not a job, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? I think it's uh it's awesome. I think uh it's gonna make a lot of you know, you see it's gonna I believe it's gonna give a lot of opportunity to different players outside who who necessarily doesn't don't make the league, uh who have good seasons enough to get branded but don't quite pan out. I think it's gonna give them opportunities to put some money in their pocket before they leave school and don't come out there and just be broke. A lot of cats leave school and just don't have 
no money and they wind up taking dead end jobs or probably looking for their career. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I think this gives them opportunity to put some money in their pocket so they can figure out what they love. Okay. okay. Now I see you on Instagram, man. You do you big on fitness. So am I with my train so all university brand. Tell me about I can fitness. Uh I can fit my it's my my part with my partner. I came on a little later. He uh he started the gym, believe it or not, out of out of the garage in this complex he's lived in. And uh so he's built up for maybe like five or six clients to over like four hundred now. It's uh we got two locations. And uh, it's like a well-oiled machine, man. People are getting like you know real people, real results. They uh, they do a tremendous job with you know taking care of your body with different uh, how to train, when to train, meal plans, uh, different little programs we call them for like boxing. You know, I can't run, uh, rip camp. You know, ass and abs stuff that you know is. It's for all fitness levels. Uh, I think it's like uh, it's boutique fitness uh, gym, but I think it's we got a real foothold in South Florida, and I think it's uh, if you lay around for it, it's gonna be something huge. You played three levels, well, all levels of football. How does relationship between player and coach change from high school to college to pros? It it really depends on the coach. To me, it depends on the coach. Uh, you have some coaches that's like in high school, like, you know, father figures. You got college coaches that's kind of like, you know, good ones that's gonna become like, like that big brother type. And then you got coaches in the league that's gonna be your homeboy. And y'all can have like a real conversation about both of y'all are men. Uh, but then you got, at the same time, you got bad coaches, just bad all around. But depending on where you where you are, the coaching level changes. Some coach can help you understand it, and some coach can tell you, "Hey, this is what you do," and then chew you out when you do it wrong. But they can't really explain to you how to do it if you give them a picture. Yeah, uh, you know the game of football. Like the the higher level, you, the higher you go up, they say it's, it's, it gets faster and faster and faster. No, it's just, you know, you start processing it slower <laughs> yeah. and uh, and you'll be fine. But, uh, you know, it, it got to take a special coach to kind of relay that message to you, how you break down film, how you look at whatever concept they got going on or whatever the plays is and teach you how to process that play. So when you ain't your mind, your mind ain't running a thousand miles a minute trying to, when they call the snap and from between the snap and when you get the ball or, the play start or or what have you. So I mean it's all about who you uh who your coach is and how you coach. I think I personally believe, but you know, they giving coaches jobs out to everybody nowadays, it seems like <laughs> you talked about tradition from coming from UM, they have a big tradition, Green Bay, then you went to Pittsburgh, another story franchise. What was it like playing for Coach T, Mike Tomlin? Oh, Mike T was cool. He was like that uh he was more so like that, uh, I want to say your homeboy, yeah, he, yeah. he treated you like a man. Like his first year, he definitely treated you like a man. And uh, and that's his whole thing, hey, I'm gonna treat you like a man, I respect you, act like one. And you know, show up on time, you do what you need to do. And uh, so he was, he was cool, he was cool, very cool in that aspect. He was, I don't want to say he was no nonsense, but he was just like, he was understanding. He knew, you know, he respected you as a man, and he just, I thought he, I thought he was a great coach from the, the moment he stepped in. Uh, BC was another coach that I thought, you know, was going to be like just uh, Bill Coward was another coach I thought was just going to be, uh, what's the word? Just like, you know, you see him on TV, you see what the persona is on TV. Actually, like when I came over there, he just, you know, he brought me in and we talked. Uh, about 20 or 30 minutes, if I remember correctly. And uh and we like we didn't talk about no football. Okay. And we were just I guess he was just trying to get to know me and uh and I was, you know, he was letting me know who he was. And uh that's it. After that, you know, he stood up, shook my hand, and, hey, welcome to the Steelers. Yeah. 
<laughs> so I that was uh I see your son beasting out, man. I see you got a little clips on YouTube and Instagram, your son playing ball. Do you want him to prolong if he want to? Would you encourage him if he want to try to play pro football, doing, you know, with concussions and everything, stuff you going through after you retire from the NFL? Do you still want to proceed in football or, or is this just his decision, whatever he want to do? It's his decision. When I, when I sit back and I look at it and I look at it, you know, what he does on the field, like he can line up literally anywhere and everywhere. I just try to give him, you know, tidbits and pointers and and this is what it takes to be a professional. This is what you want to do. These are some of the sacrifices you're going to have to make. And uh, he excels at it, you know what I mean? So sometimes you hear him saying, hey, I want to you know, play professional football. And other times, he, you know, he's talking about something else. But I just let him, I think as a father, you know, I, to give him what I got is uh, just understanding what it takes. Because, yeah, you know, you, you go anywhere, you're going to be a thousand kids, you know, saying they're going to play professional football. But, you know, you know only five percent of us make it. Yeah. You know, he has a lot of the, the intangibles. So it's like, you know, you got an opportunity, you got a real shot. But this is what it's going to take. So after that, either way, you know, as long as he's happy doing what he loves, it's fine with me. All right, this is the last segment of the show. It's called a firing squad where I ask you quick questions, answer it as quick as possible, as truthful as possible. All right. Psychology state there's only two emotions, being love and fear. Which one you rather? Love. What what is your biggest fear? Heights. I agree with you on that, brother. I'm with that. I don't do roller coasters, all planes. Um, top five running backs in the NFL currently. Dalvin Cook, he went to high school, my high school. Other than that, I ain't really been watching it like that. I couldn't even tell you. I say Dalvin, Derrick Henry, Kamara, Christian McCaffrey, and my boy from um, Aaron Jones, Green Bay. Um, <laughs> best coach you ever played for? Don Solinger. Who's the worst coach you ever played for? I don't want to say he was the worst, but he had he had no idea what he was doing. Sometimes, uh, <laughs> yeah, dude named Parnell. Okay. If you're on an island, you're stuck on an island, you're by yourself. What three things are you bringing? With you? I don't know. That's a tough one. Hopefully, a lifeboat. And <laughs> <laughs> some oil or a motor or something to get me off that island. <laughs> When it's all said and done, how do you want everyone to remember Nazi Devil? I ain't never really think about it like that. You know what I mean? I just, uh, I want them to, I want them to remember me for, you know, I don't know. Definitely not for football. You know what I mean? I just want them to remember me for a dude that, uh, they kind of stood up when it was time to stand up. So you want to be known as a stand-up guy? Respectable. I understand that. I respect that. Well, Mr. Davenport, I appreciate you coming on my podcast, sir. Is there anything you want, your, your website, whatever you got going on, you want to put out there? No, I'm good. I appreciate it. All right, sir. I thank you. Have a blessed one. Appreciate you. All right, you too. All right, brother.